I cannot get in. Yo, I cannot hear. No, no. Yeah. Can't, can't hear any audio. Yeah, I think on Teams we can hear, hear each other, but not uh, BSC. So we can hear each other online, but they can't hear us in the room, I'm guessing. Correct. Right. I just sent a text message to the people in the room. Maybe they'll get that. Thank you.
this system was started under a BCP, uh, initially intended to be for interoperability primarily, but also some in enhanced operability uh, capabilities, in other words, day-to-day -day use as well. And because of the success of the program, it's more and more agencies are coming to us asking, specifically California Highway Patrol, uh, in particular, to say, hey, uh, can this be a, a daily use system for us? So we're transitioning to that. We've got a total of 56 sites installed, 54 in wide area trunking. Those two differences between there, um, we're working on bringing them into that wide area trunking system as well. So you bring the site up, make sure that it works locally, and then you integrate it into the rest of the solution. We've got scheduled to have 59 sites up by the end of the fiscal year, which is the end of June. Uh, that's well ahead of the BCP numbers that we had, and the BCP for that particular project ends in June. We're working on a VHF expansion for some of our local partners. So we had Mono County come to us, Lassen County, and more recently Nevada County and a couple of others, San Benito County, asking, hey, if we partner with the state, can we leverage some of those resources, namely the cores that control the sites? Um, and then we bring some resources with, with the, the local agency, bring some of their resources. And so we're building some of that out as well. We've got, um, a, you know, like I said, San Benito and Nevada County and a couple of other rural counties we're working with as well that are in the initial stages of just asking the question, hey, can we partner with the state, uh, bring some local resources with us. One of our big challenges we're running into is the leasing process. So these sites, um, pretty much in the state of California, the first entity that needed radio coverage in an area negotiated a lease with whoever owned that property. Mostly it was Department of Interior or some other federal agency, BLM, whatever. And then they established the lease and then over time, more and more users keep coming, uh, public safety users. So these sites don't always have the space for Chris. Uh, Chris takes a significant amount of power. Um, we've got to make sure that the microwave system is updated and um, there's not always space in the in the vault for that. And then the power, additional power requirements sometimes require some updates to the power facility. Since Cal OES doesn't maintain all those leases ourselves, we partner with that first agency that was there. Um, primarily that's uh, Cal Fire and, and obviously CHP and then Department of Transportation parks, fish and wildlife, those agencies have, um, you know, that main lease that's there. So that's one of the challenges that we're running into that we just have to adjust moving forward. We have submitted um, a BCP to fund further activity on this. I'll cover that in a little while, but the funding model moving forward and what we're going to do come July is really dependent on the outcome of that BCP. So we've got some different things that we're considering but that's really what uh, will drive things moving forward. So any question on, on the current status of Chris and where we're at? All right. I, I, have, I have one question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, Nick Beard, uh, Department of Technology. One of the questions that I have with the location of the uh, information that you're looking for, the, the equipment, how big of a space are you looking for to, to be able to house this information? For, I'm talking specifically to the leasing issue that you have. So a typical rack, it's it's two racks of equipment that we need to put in. So we need two complete rack spaces, and it's just not always available in these vaults. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'd like to, to consider as well, you, you pushed out a lot of partners there as well, but um, CDT is pushing out the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, as you know. Um, with that, we have 170 plus ish, don't quote me on that number, huts, 12 by 20 units, essentially co-locations. Let's speak after this and we can probably talk to you what, what needs are and maybe connect you with our team. Okay. Yeah, that'd be exciting. So David, that's for your action right there in the meeting. So David Andre is our senior engineer that's heading up the Chris deployment. So he'll he'll definitely get with you right after this meeting. Appreciate Perfect. that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Positive outcome of this meeting. <laughs> right. That's, that's kind of amazing. All right. So um uh, what what's needed if you're an agency interested to transition over to Chris? There's some forms you've got to fill out uh, by working with uh, PSC. Uh, Steve Yarbrough is your first point of contact there, and you certainly can use Chris for primary dispatch. Um, but 
we don't have a dispatch center you could use, so it would be your dispatch facilities that you're leveraging to use this. Um, agencies can connect their consoles that are in their dispatch center to our core. That's not a problem. And obviously, control stations can be used if you're within RF range of the system. And we really are uh, have built this out to be a resilient network. We've got two different cores that are in active, active mode. Uh, one located here in Northern California, one in Southern California, each with the capacity to support 100% of the users. So if one of the cores go down, uh, we can support both. And those are sized to, to support 100% of the users in the entire state if all state agencies were to come out of this system. So don't think that we, you know, we've got any kind of capacity issue there. And obviously in the event of some kind of catastrophic issue, whether that's just connectivity to that core is not available or the core itself goes down, the other core picks up that load and all sites are backhauled to both of those core sites in a redundant network. And we're also working on a way to augment our network connectivity so that it's not only relying on our statewide CAPSnet system, which Moises will provide a brief out on here in a minute, which is a very reliable system, but we are also wanting to build in additional layers there in the event something catastrophic happened with that system. We, we don't want to leave ourselves. If everyone's moving over to this statewide trunk system, we want to make sure that it has the resiliency needed. Um, and we've got multiple levels of failure that we've accounted for and just built right into the system. So if you're interested in coming on and using Chris as your primary communications uh, channel for dispatch, let us know. Uh, we certainly uh, know that that's a long process to do the planning of, but but that's really where we're headed. We'd like to move away from the 37 disparate radio systems that we manage for the state today and over time migrate into this network. And I'll be giving you a brief uh, toward the end of today's presentation to kind of cover some of the technology things that we're looking at moving forward. So any other questions on Chris? Any questions from the committee? All right, we'll move on to our next item, which is the CAPSnet update. Wait one moment, Moises. Can can we go to the ledge? Let's see if we can do that. Yeah, I'm available. If everyone can hear me, this is Paul. Yeah, we can hear you. Go, yeah. go ahead, Paul. Oh, fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Paul McGinnis from Legislative Affairs. A um, couple quick um, updates from our shop, and then I was going to go through a bill list, um, and then I can circulate the the updated list uh, with the group. Um, after this or following the meeting, just for everyone's um, awareness and reference. Um, just a couple quick uh, announcements. We had our, our new deputy director, Bridget Kolakoski, was uh, sworn in on April 8th. Um, and we've undergone somewhat of a reorg, so we're now considered the Legislative and Governmental Affairs Office. So good changes to come. Um, I'll now go into an update of some bills that that we um, some running bills that we've identified that have an impact to telecommunications um, as a whole. Um, first is uh, AB 1863. So this is uh, this bill would actually revise how and when the CHP uh, must issue a feather alert. Um, the bill is on suspense file. We have a number of bills on suspense file um, if they have a fiscal impact. So we are waiting for um, this Thursday actually to see whether or not these bills uh, survive. Um, next is AB 3020, which is the 211 uh, Infrastructure Act. The bill upon appropriation would require OPR, Office of Planning and Research, uh, to establish and convene the 211 Strategic Advisory Committee. Uh, the bill would require the committee to be comprised uh, uh, composed of specified members. Um, uh, that would also include the, the director of Cal OES. Um, AB 3062 uh, would authorize a fire protection district uh, to require an electrical corporation or uh, local, locally publicly owned uh, electric utility to notify the, the district at least 24 hours before performing a prescribed or controlled burn. Uh, AB 3090 uh, would authorize and encourage a public water system uh, when updating an emergency notification plan to provide notification to water users 
by means of other communications technology, uh, including but not limited to text messages, email, or social media. Uh, just a couple of, a couple more bills here I wanted to, to highlight. Um, SB 1003 is the Electrical Corporation's Wildfire Mitigations Plans Bill. Uh, it would require electrical corporations to take into account both the need to minimize the risk of catastrophic wildfire as soon as possible and the amount of risk addressed for the cost of the uh, proposed mitigation within the utilities wildfire mitigation plan. And then uh, last but not least here, SB 1220, uh, which is a bill we've been looking at uh, closely. Um, and I know we've got some imp input from PSC on this one, but um, SB 1220 uh, would prohibit state and local agencies authorized to provide or enter into contracts relating to public benefit programs, along with 211 and 988 services uh, from contracting with out of state call centers and restricts the use of, art of, uh, of AI, artificial intelligence, and automated decision systems that um, eliminate or automate core job functions, and that's defined in the bill um, of a worker. Uh, we've got a few, a couple other federal bills. Um, a lot of the federal bills we previously identified um, seem to um, either be dead or not, or have not moved in the last few months. Um, but uh, there is one that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention, which is uh, the 988 Lifeline Cybersecurity Responsibility Act. Um, it's HR 9498. Uh, uh, this bill would require uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to undertake efforts to protect the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline from cybersecurity threats. And the bill last action on that was March 24th. Um, in the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee at the federal level. Um, that's all the bills I wanted to highlight for the group this morning. Like I said, again, I'll, I'll circulate this um, list and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. So if there are uh, pending questions, that's the end of my report this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Do any of the committee members have questions for Paul McGinnis? All right. Uh, one question here, Paul. Paul, it's not a question. This is Nick from uh, California yeah. Department of Technology. Inside of the chat, um, I think a couple of individuals mm -hmm. were interested in receiving that list. Is that something that we would be able to okay. post either through the chat or after the meeting? Yeah, yeah. I'll You're send awesome. it. I'll send it right now to the chat so everyone Thank can so look much. at it. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Paul? Moises, we'll go get back to you. Thank you for being patient. Yep. All right, good morning. My name is Moises Lopez. I'm the Microwave Division Chief here at Public Safety Communications. I'll be providing an update on the status of the CAPSNET upgrade. So this upgrade, as most of you know, started in 2018, and we're in year six of that. Uh, I'd like to report that out of the 294 sites that were scheduled to get an upgrade for the new technology, uh, we're up to 222 sites uh, completed, and um, we're planning an additional 2072 sites over the next year and uh, year and a half. Uh, for the for the remainder of this calendar year, we do have an aggressive build plan with uh, 58 sites scheduled to be completed, um, and then uh, that should take us into about 90 percent uh, completion rate there. The CAPSNET build out is uh, working in conjunction with the CRIS rollout, as Butch mentioned. <clears throat> We're looking to support wherever CRIS is going to upgrade the microwave network uh, to have that capability there. And then uh, one of the things that we're doing uh, after the upgrade to MPLS is planning and implementing circuit cutovers to the new technology. So. Uh, in essentially replacing the legacy TDM and analog circuits with the IP based technology. And that's going to require some uh, revisits to all the sites that essentially got the upgrade. We'll have to go back, rip out the racks of old equipment. So we'll be coordinating with the agencies that we talked about CHP, DOT, CAL FIRE mainly, and uh, looking for your support in that effort. 
that's where we are today, but where are we going to uh, in the future? Uh, next slide, please. So um, where are we looking to, to uh, get CapsNet to get to? Uh, as we're seeing the landscape evolve from it to IP-based systems, uh, Chris is one uh, network that we're looking to support. The California Earthquake Early Warning System is another uh, system that's out there that we're supporting from a backhaul perspective. Next Gen 911. So, as most of you know, we have 450 plus PSAPs across the state, and those uh, are getting their primary and secondary backhaul through uh, vendors, the integrators that are out there. But we're looking at microwave to become a tertiary type of backhaul in case those primary and secondary vendors fail. We're looking to support uh, consoles, dispatch consoles that, that some of the agencies are uh, deploying from an IP perspective. We're also looking to integrate additional backhaul, as Budge was mentioning, transport beyond microwave. So microwave is great. It's reliable. It's everywhere in the state, but there's uh, limitations in bandwidth just due to the RF spectrum that's available to us. So we're looking at other technologies such as fiber. I think uh, CDT, Nick, you mentioned middle mile initiatives. So that's great. Looking to leverage some of that um, infrastructure money that California got, that $6 billion plus, to see where we can uh, access some of that fiber in locations that are close to um, where microwave is. And because that project aligns closely with deploying the rural areas, that's where most of our microwave uh, needs are. We're also looking to leverage other technologies such as private LTE um, and satellite where feasible. As far as uh, supporting additional uh, networks, we're looking to provide backhaul transport for, sec for securing other networks. So for example, um, DOT, if DOT needs access to, or not access, but if DOT requires a secure backhaul transport for some of their uh, camera systems that are maybe out there, they could we could be able to support that by providing uh, excluded zones so that it doesn't interfere with the rest of the network. We're also looking at uh, integrating software-defined networking, which is another capability that's out there today using MPLS. So currently our technology allows us to reroute traffic when one site goes off the air <clears throat> by completely rerouting it from a, from one location to another, <clears throat> excuse me. But software defined networking would allow us to look at when a route, for example, is getting utilized beyond capacity and start that rerouting process earlier instead of in a complete down scenario. And lastly, we're looking to integrate GIS data to include several layers so that we can have a one view for the SOC, um, the State Operations Center, that they can have a single view to look at if there's a site that comes, the site information where you can click on it, look at what hardware is there, what software you're running, some of the procedures to access the site, um, what staffing is required to support that site, and traffic data from a uh, backhaul perspective as to what kind of utilization we're running on a particular microwave network or microwave route. Um, that's my update for today. I'm open for questions. Are there any questions or comments from the committee members? Okay, thank you for that update. We'll now move into committee member briefings and uh, we'll run through the uh, uh, in, in the order that we have them in the slide deck. So I think the first one will be Department of Fish and Wildlife. Did we have anyone here to discuss this particular item? All right, we'll move to the next one. Department of Transportation. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, this is Ferdinand from Caltrans. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't attend there. I, have, I had an appointment here, just couldn't make it in time back and forth from, from Roseville. So I'll, I'll try my best next time. Uh, so um, right now we don't have any uh, BCPs um, going for uh, for our, uh, any radio systems, no legislation um, 
um, that's affecting our, our radio systems right now. So our initiatives, uh, you, I think you're showing on the screen, um, we just purchased roughly 5,400 portables, mobiles, and some uh, infrastructure equipment a couple of years ago for, uh, I guess District 12 should be in there too, but District 3 is Sacramento, District 4 is the San Francisco Bay Area, and District 8 is uh, San Bernardino um, County. Um, so um, PSC is programming uh, those radios right now. We have probably over a thousand deployed already. Um, we, in conjunction with that, we also developed uh, new code plugs, um, statewide code plugs. So we went from maybe uh, 80 to 100 to maybe a dozen or 15 or so um, code plugs. So that's really uh, helping us to manage and, and minimize our cost uh, for that aspect of uh, radio code plugs and radio programming. Uh, we're doing uh, LMR LTE testing on the first net network. Um, our first uh, experience with uh, the iPhones uh, did not go well. The iPhone uh, app uh, was not easy to use. So we're taking a look at working with AT&T and FirstNet, taking a look at other equipment uh, that's maybe a little more user friendly um, for us. But uh, hopefully that will be a, a something positive that we can use to enhance uh, our radio coverage gaps. Um, and I don't know if um, folks are, are, watch, uh, are watching or, or uh, observing what's going on, but uh, the 4.9 gigahertz spectrum, which was uh, initially dedicated for public safety use, there's been different notice of proposed rulemakings from the FCC the last maybe three or four years. And um, right now there's some rumors that uh, FCC may be planning to give the spectrum to FirstNet, which will be really detrimental for us for all of us here. I think uh, I know we use it for backhaul. You you guys mentioned uh, backhaul uh, a minute ago. Uh, the six gigahertz spectrum, which uh, which uh, traditionally uh, public safety radio communications use for backhaul, the FCC is already um, allowed use of uh, uh, non a uh, uh, non public safety commercial use for that spectrum. Uh, there's some states that are experiencing interference in that spectrum, so 4.9 would be maybe. A feasible spectrum to go to, uh, but now um, again, FCC is trying to take that away from public safety. So uh, we're 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 working with the National Wireless Co Council. Um, Ashto is um, um, Ashto is the uh, uh, a uh, the committee that I represent the 50 DOT. So uh, we're really um, um, involved with trying to preserve this um, spectrum for public safety. Um, 5.9 spectrum. Um, that's the uh, spectrum used for connected vehicles, uh, where vehicles can share information uh, vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure, such as um, if a vehicle's uh, approaching an intersection and if uh, if the uh, system detects that the vehicle cannot make um, the green light or or cannot make the yellow, um, it'll it'll signal the the uh, the the vehicle. And uh, right now we're also doing a vehicle to pedestrian vehicle to cycle um, um, communication. So, and also the, the FCC allocated 75 megahertz of this bandwidth, and now we're left with 30 um, for this purpose. Um, again, uh, FCC is uh, providing the other 45 to uh, non-commercial uh, Wi-Fi uni um, users. So uh, public safety is really hurting for spectrum right now. Um, so I think we need to do all we can to preserve what we have. We just don't have the billions of dollars um, to go into auction, right? Um, so um, it would help if we can we can just preserve what we have. Um, uh, Moises um, uh, uh, mentioned satellites, so Caltrans is um, piloting some Leo Starlink technology for their satellite um, program. Um, or um, early testing with uh, drones and in areas where there are no radio coverage or cellular um, uh, coverage has been pretty positive. Uh, with our drones, so uh, we're happy to uh, to report out uh, once we get more uh, systems uh, um, underway, and more testing done. And as I think CDT is here, um, we're assisting Caltrans is with installing. The number always changes: fifteen hundred miles, two thousand miles of of uh, middle mile broadband uh, fiber. I'm installing in our right away, um, and we're we're heavily uh, um, providing. Uh, our support and help and support to uh, CDT and its uh, and its third party um, subcontractors. Um, connected automated vehicle, that's what CAV means. Um, I think that's in conjunction with a 5.9 um, gigahertz spectrum. Um, so um, I think that's I think uh, what we have in Caltrans going on for public safety.
uh, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Any questions or comments from committee members? All right, thank you for that update from Caltrans. We'll now move to the we'll now move to the Department of Parks and Recreation. Good morning, Evan Walter with California State Parks. Um, our brief updates are um, working with vendors to seek push to talk communication. So similar to Caltrans report out, looking at first net technology on some of the coastal areas to support uh, lifeguard operations where they don't need a full radio uh, system. They don't need a backhaul to our dispatch centers. Um, so we're working through that. Also looking at um, Verizon and T-Mobile. Um, looking at trialing the equipment, we just need it to be lifeguard proof, so waterproof, sandproof. Uh, so we'll be looking at that towards the end of summer. Um, we are close to completing our refresh of outfitting every officer with an APX 8000. Uh, we are also looking at acquiring 30 of the APX Next radios so that we can start looking at uh, LTE uh, connectivity as well. Um, and then we'll just be continuing to purchase so that we can uh, have one radio per uh, position uh, as we're increasing our staffing to try and go back up to full staffing. Uh, for CRIS deployment, um, so we have finally gotten the CRIS talk groups programmed into our new inner talk consoles, uh, working through making sure that that is adequately recorded in our audio recorders at the dispatch centers. And um, now we just need to make sure that the programming is ironed out and we are hoping to have Chris dispatched talk groups at Channel Coast within the next few weeks. Uh, and then we'll be looking at onboarding a couple of other Southern California districts uh, as well as uh, two Northern California districts. So uh, very exciting stuff. Um, we recently entered into a uh, interagency agreement to provide dispatching services for 25 Cal Fire law enforcement officers. Uh, so currently State Parks provides dispatch for State Park officers, Fish and Wildlife, uh, and now some Cal Fire plus a handful of other agencies. Uh, we'll be looking at as we increase staffing, um, seeing if there's dispatching needs for other agencies that don't currently have that. So. Um, and then I think our only uh, anticipated budget constraint is just that our our internal budget has not increased as the cost of operations has gone up. So we'll be looking at uh, trying to rectify that uh, either internally or most likely through BCP. So that's the uh, end of report for Parks and Recreation. Thank you for that briefing. Does any committee members have questions, questions or comments for Evan? Yes, go ahead, Tess. Tess, you're back with the Department of Finance. Hopefully you can hear me. Second. Um... I guess it's kind of more circling back, um, more of a theoretical question maybe, or maybe a topic for a future agenda, but going back to something that um, that Caltrans mentioned in their briefing about um, experimenting with new technologies such as Starlink, um, I was just wondering if, if um, anyone or any departments or agencies uh, can answer to what extent we're, we're looking at those future technologies that are, are you know, we're evolving towards um, and we're beginning to experiment, experiment with, um, you know, the interoperability with kind of the systems that we've heard are we're, we're building out throughout the state and also looking forward at, you know, the future technologies that we're um, really quickly hurtling towards as a state and, and the reliability between those two. I, I, I'm going to make one comment here. I'm going to let Budge answer the, the, the meat of that question, but um, we have um, uh, 355 towers plus another 2,000 towers or antennas throughout the state of California in, in this network that we have. And when you look at it, it's it's late 20th century technology. So, you know, we are looking at, uh, to get beyond that. There's a lot of money that goes into servicing that old technology. And, um, and so the answer to your question is yes. And I'm going to let Budge tell you about some exciting things. So I've got a slide coming up in a few slides where I'm going to give an overview of some of the technology that we've looked at, but we think your question is extremely important. We'll certainly add it to the agenda as a standing agenda item. And then for all the agencies that are participating, as you learn of these technologies, when I present it in a moment what we've discovered, we know you're doing the same thing. So we would appreciate us collaborating. And then, you know, what works for parks may not work perfect for CAL FIRE. 
uh, or CHP, as there's all have different needs. So what we're trying to do is give some options and price points because the resiliency that you need, the coverage footprint that you have, varies so differently from agency to agency. So we're trying to get some information out there on what is available. And then the next step would be, okay, can we make it resilient to public safety grade? That's what the PSC team can test and validate. We can then get some of those units in your hands for you to take out in the field and test. We have the ability to do that. And then from there, we would come up with the cost model and how do we build it? And then obviously that circles back full circle with through DOF and in the budget. But that's some of the things that we're looking at. And we've uh, tried to embrace all those technologies. It's one of the key reasons why we attend the different conferences and um, venues that are out there so we can meet with these vendors and just see what's coming. So all of that is on the roadmap, and I'll give you an overview of some of the stuff Cal OES is seeing. And if anyone else at the table is is looking at something, please share. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Budge. And and as a team, too, um, as we bring in new technology, we need to look at how do we responsibly sunset some of the older technology so that we don't uh, have any you know uh, lasting fiscal impacts or things of that nature that we, we have to deal with. Well, what Budge meant to say is you can answer your question in more detail in a few slides. So cool. Mm -hmm. Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. All right. Good morning. Uh, all right. Well, in terms of interoperability, all right. Uh, we've been working with uh, our CAL FIRE uh, law enforcement maybe over the past 18 months or so uh, as a special use case to expand roughly 160 officers equipped. Uh, with Motorola APX uh, all band, you know, configured with 700, 800 um, that either have access to Chris now or, or, or are in the process of having access to it, uh, as well as several other, um, you know, um, county trunk systems throughout the state, um, as well as, and it was already just mentioned, as well as uh, parks, uh, law enforcement dispatching. Um, we have six code plugs under development. Um, by PSC actually as we as we speak and will likely be finished in the next couple of weeks um, of various complexity, right? So we have several different groups of code plugs um, that are again use case based uh, in how our law enforcement officers are are engaged with their local government throughout the state as well as Chris. Um, as soon as those uh, code plugs are finished, uh, we'll be in lockstep to have those deployed uh, just after. Um, and then we're also evaluating how we may um, introduce interoperability for incident management and wildland fire. Um, this is, of course, often into the future, right? We don't have uh, a, a, a plan well laid out and how we would do this given all the constraints that goes around um, communicating on uh, incidents. Um, though I'll, I can say some examples of this um, are that our MCC vehicles are now uh, equipped with uh, APX 8500s and are uh, going through testing with our incident management communication leaders um, and how best that those could be implemented in, in those types of environments. Um, and then uh, lastly, we're also looking at the feasibility of utilizing Chris for things like um, our state intercoms uh, and the audio traffic that um, is typically used between dispatching and our um, uh, air attack bases. That's all for me. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions or comments from the committee? Okay, we'll move on to uh, uh, Department of, so the next groupings, uh, do not have a, a specific slide, but you know, give everyone an opportunity if they have something to add. So we'll run through uh, the different uh, members here. Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Anything for the team? Not a bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mercy Medical Services Authority. Thank you, sir. Uh, the only update that we have is we're getting closer to getting our uh, BCP uh, mobile radios and handheld radios up and running. Uh, in 2022, we had a BCP to purchase 334 um, APX 8500s, which are gonna be divided amongst our AMSA staff. We're gonna have caches available for our California medical assistance teams to be deployed out. 
168 of those radios are going to be deployed as uh, out into the regions, all six regions to be handled by the our regional disaster medical health specialist for ambulance strike team deployments. So we know that each region has a specific need of radio channels, and we're working with the regions to figure out what those are so that then we can program their cache of radios with the with the channels that they're looking for. So that when we pull an ambulance strike team from, say, Reading and have to send them to Los Angeles, they're obviously not going to have those radio channels all programmed into their radios. So we'll be able to give them the radios. That uh, that seems to that's seeming to be a little more difficult than originally anticipated because of the MOUs that we now have to enter into with each and every one of those agencies, and some of which are not as uh, not as likely or they're not wanting to give us the ability to program those channels into our radios. Uh, And so we're still working through that. Hopefully that we can get all the radios programmed with the channels that's needed by each of those regions so that it doesn't uh, hinder the medical response for all of those, you know, immediate need ambulance strike teams. Um, anything else, Tim? I'm checking my notes. Okay. Oh, uh, well. For uh, all of our EMSA radios, those are currently sitting, we're waiting for a time slot with uh, er, uh, three here for those to be, uh, the code plugs to be finalized and for our radios to be programmed. So as soon as we can, it's our term in line, then we'll have those radios up and running. I think that's all I got. Thank you, Tim. Does the committee members have any questions or comments for Tim, EMSA? Okay, we'll move on to the Department of Technology. Uh, this is Victor Krauss from Department of Technology. Uh, nothing as far as our need on radios for use of radios. However, I do want to announce to the committee that I've been working with uh, Steve Yarbrough. We'll be submitting the CRIS system to the Tech Republic Digital State Survey 2024 as one of the accomplishments within the uh, state of California over the last two years of the implementation of uh, all the wonderful things we've been doing with that program so far. Um, I'll go ahead and share the um, draft article with uh, the folks here so that way you can see what will be published probably. I think it, it, they do a, um, a publication, then a report card rating all 50 states, and this would be one of many projects that we're showing uh, with a uh, digital strategy for the state of California. Most of the information we we gleaned um, and sanitized was off of the Chris website and some of the project details of our project over uh, overview of what's been accomplished over the last two years. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Does anybody have any commentary or questions for um, Department of Technology. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the Department of Water Resources. Any uh, commentary there? Uh, nothing uh, from DWR, thank you. thank you. Okay, thank you. Department of Justice. Okay, the uh, California Military Department. California Department Public of Health. Public of Public Health. No updates. Okay, um, California Highway Patrol. Yeah, we're uh, no uh, BCP related information from CHP and no current legislative issues with CHP, but a quick, a quick Chris update from from CHP. Uh, historically, we've uh, quick history lesson with CHP with with uh, the Chris system. We ran into some significant issues with our patrol car technology advancing that was interfering with low band. And so there's been some urgency for CHP to to migrate to Chris as a primary system for us. About 17 months ago, the project started and we're just uh, about there hoping to go live in the next few weeks is our plan. The radios have been programmed, at least in the Sacramento area. Patrol vehicles have been uh, programmed there as well, where we purchased about a thousand APX Next radios. Long ways to go. Certainly, that's an issue for us uh, financially and funding-wise. With 7,000 uniformed 
members will uh, we're, we're hoping with a, a BCP that we have that will continue to purchase the radios that will have enough to eventually outfit the entire state but certainly we have some challenges with that but our focus has been Sacramento for now with this uh, with this project Sacramento Communication Center the the consoles the intertalk consoles have been programmed we've had some certainly some technology uh, concerns and some hurdles overcome connecting Chris with Motorola and uh, with Intertalk, but that's, I think it's just about worked out and uh, we're hoping to be alive in the next few weeks. And just the North Sac area, we have 105 areas and 24 comm centers. We've broken this up by comm centers and that'll be our kind of our project plan is by communication center. So SACCOM is, uh, servers are installed and we're, we're, uh, we're sort of unofficially live there. And uh, North Sac is again, our first our first go live area on a primary as a, as a primary radio uh, channel. And then uh, from there, the plan will be to kind of grow the Sacramento area to turn on the areas sequentially in the, uh, in the Sacramento region that are all connected to SACCOM. And so uh, we're excited. We have some, again, some urgency with patrol car technology advancing. There's uh, some concerns as the, the next platform of vehicles with uh, computer modules and LEDs continue to interfere with low band. We really have some urgency and some, some uh, some focus that this is a successful project and it seems like so far things are uh, are looking uh, that way and we're optimistic that it'll be successful so we're hoping by the next meeting we'll have a report on our our go live and what that looks like at least in the sacramento area in, in just into one field office and then we'll go from there uh, in terms of uh, you mentioned another technology we have some interest in satellite as well of course with chp literally being border to border uh, north south east west we have some areas some regions that uh, terrain is incredibly challenging, not only for low band radio, but also for Chris and for LTE that we're using to augment the Chris network. Uh, we've began some research into some of the satellite options out there. Mobile is challenging, of course, um, and so we're not sure that technology is there yet, but we've begun some informal research into, into that, what that looks like on a mobile platform, um, connecting back to LTE, back to a patrol car. So. Uh, that'll be a huge advantage to us if something's out there if someone's aware of something we have a strong interest in that in our north area especially redding and up to the uh to the oregon border of course and then in the east as well in the mountainous areas some real communication technologies for uh, for chp and the chris network we're optimistic in the long run with some vhf channels maybe we'll assist but we certainly know it's not going to cover our areas and as we have to phase out low band because of again patrol cars we have some real concerns with those areas and so hopefully in the near future there's some some other options um, in that satellite uh, world that's it from chp thank you for that update do we have any uh questions or comments from the committee uh department of finance just want to provide a quick update on two um bcps one in the governor's budget and one in the recently announced big revision um, the governor's budget proposal contains a, a, a proposal that will support and expand the public safety radio um, system and also support equal access to 911 services. And it would authorize a five cent increase to the state emergency telephone number account or SETNA, um, that surcharge. And that would bring the total fee to 35 cents per access line. And this would provide four years of funding for 13 limited term positions and then 12 additional new positions that would help support this effort. Um, and then the recently announced Bay revision um, contains a proposal that would authorize 23.7 million in the SETNA funding authority that would be um, also funded in that five cent increase I mentioned from the governor's budget proposal. And this would provide four years of funding for the equipment necessary to support the expansion of the, the CRIS system. And um, so the governor's budget proposal is still awaiting a vote from the legislature. Um, and then obviously the May revision proposal just announced yesterday um, is set to be heard and voted on before the legislature this summer. So finance will just continue to provide updates to you all in the coming months on the status of those two. Thank you for that update. Does anyone from the committee have any questions or comments for uh, Department of Finance? OK, we're going to now move into the uh, technology discussion. Um, and before, uh, Buds, did you want to any commentary here? Or do you want me to talk about our trip yesterday or? Yeah, you go for it. OK, thank you.
it was already mentioned about the BCP. Um, and uh, we've just got some objectives here. I'll leave those as takeaways. But really, we know that a statewide radio system supporting the operational needs of all the state agencies is what we're looking toward. That's going to be a journey. So don't think it's a flip of the switch. It's going to take time. And we want equal access to that agent to that system for all state agencies, provided it makes sense for your agency. Hence the need for these meetings. And we want to expand that radio coverage to meet the needs of each of your agencies. Obviously, we're starting with CHP. They've got a rather hefty coverage requirement, you know, border to border, every single state highway, and then some because there's other jurisdictions that they support uh, outside of just the state highways. So that's something that we're looking at. And we really want to make sure that these radio systems are connected back into your dispatch centers. That's a key part of this strategy. So that's what the BCP is focused on. It's out there available. You can read through it. Uh, if you have any questions, certainly reach out to us. That's fine. We're tracking this very closely. And the implications going forward, we really need to understand your operational needs. Um, historically, PSC has been here. When you discover a need as an agency, you would then go get a BCP, get the funding, come talk to PSC. We would go help build that solution out. This new model changes things a little bit, right? Where if we're owning that infrastructure and have the funding to build it, then we need to build it in a way that matches your needs, which we, we need to be communicating with you on what your needs are, similar to what we do for the microwave network and other uh, systems that we support for you. So that's really going to need to be some something that we, um, we're doing a great job of collaborating now, probably the best, certainly since I've been at PSC, in uh, the 12 years that I've been here, uh, our collaboration is really good. And obviously, if this BCP doesn't go forward, there are some state agencies like CHP uh, that'll we're going to have to really figure out what we do um, because there is a desperate need to replace their radio system. And we sort of already have this ball rolling in this direction. And we'll have essentially a $27 million shortfall in how we build out the infrastructure to support the state agencies. So that's something that would definitely impact our billing and, and what we would do. So we're really uh, looking for your support uh, as this moves through the process. So if you have any questions, like I said, with this BCP, reach out to us because we understand how important it is for all of us. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the future technologies that we've been looking at. So on the graphic here, you kind of see this is Chris, essentially, right? We've got a land mobile radio system that we're building out. You got radios that are in the field, whether they're portables or mobiles. Chris is primarily designed for mobile coverage. However, we are seeing some extremely good results just for portable coverage as well. Um, and then obviously we've got those data centers that support uh, all the different sites throughout the state. So those sites that we mentioned um, that we're building out, uh, that's that little bubble of LMR coverage. As we build more and more sites, that coverage increases. They they talk back to the core, and that's how all this interoperability happens. Provided you've got a Chris talk group in your radio, and somebody else has that same talk group programmed in their radio, you can communicate anywhere you're inside this coverage bubble. However, we know that there is other coverage out there in the state. Um, probably the, the largest coverage footprint is your publicly available LTE coverage or 5G coverage. These are through your commercial service providers like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, U.S. Cellular, all those other um, types of coverage footprints that are out there. So how can we bring them into this ecosystem in a way that's more reliable than, say, a single SIM card on a single carrier? That's the first question we're starting to ask. In addition to that, um, we have uh, purchased a couple of private 5G uh, solutions that we can roll out in terms of like a mobile command center, an instant command post. We can roll that out. If all the infrastructure is destroyed, we can provide data backhaul for first responders in a limited geographic area, but we have that capability. The price point for private 5G is, is dropping significantly. So there may be some cases where you might make a choice as a state agency to build out a, a, a private you know, 5G LTE coverage bubble to support your agency somewhere in the state. We're looking at, if you did that, how could we fold that into this ecosystem, take advantage of those coverage areas as well? In addition to that, um, there are 
low Earth orbit satellite technologies like Starlink and OneWeb that we've tested successfully. And what, how would we take advantage of, of that coverage footprint as well? And the other one on there is interesting. Um, Marv and I went on a uh, tour yesterday in San Francisco to this company called Astronus. Astronus. They are building, um, basically it's the size of a washing machine satellite that is a dedicated geo um, or a geo, <clears throat> excuse me, geosynchronous orbit <clears throat> dedicated to your use if you buy it. Now the price tag's not cheap as you can imagine, but one thing that would be interesting for a PSC is if you're purchasing KA band or KU band satellite, those are both geosynchronous type solutions that are out there. Please tell us how much you're spending on those contracts because we might be able to pool all those resources together and come close to what it would be to get a dedicated resource to the state of California, provided we start layering in a bunch of services that we would then use our own dedicated resource for instead of going out to say CalNet and, and procuring those services, which is probably where most of you are getting your satellite services from today. Um, this could be Cal OES's OASIS technologies that we use statewide. Uh, and any other satellite services that you're using. So it might make sense if we do that. Um, this would not have been possible, say, four years ago because the technology didn't exist. So it's something that we're looking at. Um, I don't know if we can quote the price, probably, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a roundabout price. That So interesting price structure. Uh, satellite, $100 million. Satellite has a lifespan of about eight years. You put down a million, and then the rest of it's you know, payments throughout. So now all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more manageable money wise because, you know, you're you're spending maybe nine million a year for that. But a couple couple watch outs. One is, you know, does it have enough throughput for all the agencies? And then there's a physics question about latency because it's sitting 25,000 miles away from us. And, you know, there what was it? Point, point zero five microseconds or whatever? It's like 500 milliseconds of delay. So yeah. But it, it's those kinds of things that we're looking at these technologies to start asking the question, as a state as a whole, which of these resources makes sense? And how can we leverage our needs as a state and maybe find some economies of scale? And, and does it make sense? And that's kind of what we're looking at. Now, once you start layering all these things together, the user experience you would want for the first responder out in the field is not have to figure out which one of those bubbles you're inside of to pick up the device to talk to reach dispatch. I mean, that's 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 what we want. So we've been experimenting with some technologies. Obviously, mission critical push to talk is a cloud hosted solution, and that provides some interesting synergies. You can connect it to the um, P25 system. And there we've been looking at a blended technology that will, you can essentially put all of these SIMs in there simultaneously. The blended technology puts them all in an active, active mode and uses all of them at the same time. So you don't have that switch over. Any of you that have used a dual SIM device know that there's usually about a 20 to 30 second delay when the one SIM fails to go to the other SIM. And during that 30 seconds, you get nothing. And you don't even know that the transitions happened until you hit the radio and you get a bonk and you have to just wait. This blended technology overcomes that because it uses them all simultaneously and uses the one that's available in that moment and aggregates all the bandwidth that's available. Um, when you start to use that blended technology, not only to support your land mobile radio system, but your mobile data needs that you have out on the field as well, the price point becomes something that makes a lot more sense. You're using one device to support all of your data needs, radio being one of them. We've also looked at some technologies that when you push the button as a user, you can prioritize which of these paths you want. And you might think, well, I would always want to go LMR. Not really, because LMR has a limited number of users. These six-pack sites that we're building can support hundreds of users, but not thousands uh, at a time, or maybe you know tens, but not hundreds. So maybe you want to default this to use your primary mode would be your public LTE 5G coverage if that's available. And if that's not available, then I'm going to use private. And if private's not available, then maybe I'll go to LMR. And if LMR is not available, okay, now I'm going to go to that satellite connection. If we own the satellite, then 
and we've got the bandwidth, maybe satellite percolates up in the priority scheme. All that's available. The user just pushes the button on the side of the radio and the technology is picking the path that's available based on the priority that you've set. We've tested these. Um, this particular solution I've drawn on the board is deployed in the state of Washington uh, in one of their fire districts, and they've been using it successfully for about six months. So these aren't pie in the sky things that that you know don't exist. They do exist. The challenge for us is, can we put it in the hands of 7,000 CHP officers? Can we scale it? And once we scale, does it make sense? Or do we get coverage on the coast where parks and fish need it, where there's a, you know notoriously gaps? Can we integrate it into our comm systems um, down in our dispatch centers with the technology that we have? Do our existing radios interface with this? And what's the infrastructure cost to do that? What's the ongoing cost of the mission critical push to talk service and which one should we use? Those are all really important questions when you scale, but we know it works. So now it's just a question of, okay, let's take a look at these technologies. Let's understand your needs as a state agency. Uh, and then we can look at, okay, what are the needs of Caltrans, Cal Fire, you know, CHP, Parks and Recs, Fish, the main body of users that we've got out there. Okay, now let's drive toward a long-term solution that meets most of those needs, knowing that it'll take us years to get there, right? This isn't something we're going to solve in the next six months. Um, obviously, there are limitations with all of this. Um, ISSI is what we use to connect between these mission critical push to talk services. We're trying to get away from a single manufacturer solution that has an, a monthly recurring cost that ties you into single manufacturer uh, for the life of that product. And that's really what we've been focused on. So we are testing these in our facility. If you hear of anything like this or you want to see what we're doing, uh, please reach out to PSC. But this is kind of where we're headed for future technology and some of the things we're looking at. And then our next step will be to come back to this board and say, okay, we've tested these. Um, let's get some of these in the hands of your folks in the field. You tell us if they work good out there, right? We can buy one or two of them, deploy them, test them, validate them. Then we come back with the cost model. How do we scale? How do we deploy this? And the one caution that I would, um, as leaders, Everybody wants to buy something new that works the same as the old one. Well, the old one was kind of lousy and didn't do what we wanted it to do anyway. So let's really think through this. And it, we don't want it to function just like the old one did. We want to make an improvement in the process. That's really what we're looking at. So that's kind of where we are with future technology. Happy to answer any questions. Tail, was that like Sacramento based or like were you testing a variety of places throughout the state? So with the picture that's on the board, we have not tested this all out, but the state of Washington did. We tested something similar to this. And instead of going through a mission critical push to talk, that little box you see there uh, that says ISSI next to it, we used a Motorola product called Smart Connect and we connected it from using all of these means that you see here. The challenge there is you have to buy a Motorola unit and then every unit that you buy is a $10 per month subscription fee for the life of the system. And we validated it here and uh, also in other places throughout the state, we know it works, but it's just that monthly subscription, you get the scale, It we ran into some challenges with it. This solution here scales better um, because the costs are lower per radio, but there are some challenges in terms of what radios do these interfaces that have shown on the board. So right now, primarily the testing has been localized to OES, and that's why we wanna talk to this larger group to say, hey, what does this trigger in your mind? Go back and talk to your teams um, in your leadership role and come to us, what testing could we do with you to, to validate this? That's kind of our next step. Do we have any more questions or comments from the committee for, for Budge or just general comments in relationship to um, technology improvements? Okay, we'll move on to the next item. The next item is the 2023-2024 uh, billing rates 
and where we're going to take those into 24 and 25. So we have a letter that we're working through our um, uh, internal approval system, but we put, you know, we anticipate an increase in your rates. I mean, it's no secret that the cost of fuel and services and everything is going up. Um, so we expect that rate letter to come to you soon, and we expect it to match what we predicted that increase would be uh, at this point. The only thing that's going to change those rates of productions, obviously, is if that BCP doesn't go through and if the state agencies that need help can't fund that assistance that you need internally, well, then, you know, and you ask us to do something, we'd have to revisit this rate. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, and I wish somebody was in the room who wrote that letter. Do you remember what the percentage was? I think it was 5% increase off the top of my head. I don't know if any of you that's received it. I think that's what we anticipated the increase was, but you've all got a letter that you received in December. We don't anticipate any changes from that prediction. We just we th we're continuing on that same course. Um, so what what you've been noticed is what we expect. Provided the BCP goes through. The uh, uh, director for Cal OES very specific about making sure that the initial rate letters went out you know, at the end of the calendar year in December. So as people were going through the budgeting process uh, to see where they were going to land the following year, that they would have that information and that there would be an update in the uh, April, May timeframe to come back and say, yeah, we validate that what we did in December is the same. So that'll continue. If any agency feels like that timeline should be adjusted to the left or right or anything because of something you're doing, let us know. And we'll, we can always uh, go back and say, hey, you know, we'll, uh, uh, you know, we can adjust how when those items are published, but uh, otherwise the intent really is to give you and your agency, um, you know, just transparent what you're going to see when you do your budgeting process so that uh, there's, there's no questions. Uh, with that said, is there any questions in relation, in relation to the rate, rate issue? Okay, then we'll move on into um, items for the future agenda. Uh, open that up for um, any of the committee members. If there's an item that you'd like to see on our next um, uh, committee meeting, just kind of leave it open to the group. Go ahead, Tess. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I think um, it would I would love to hear some of the updates from other agencies as far as new technology that they're looking at and testing. If if there are those updates, kind of consistent with what Budge provided today. Any any comments from the committee on that? If we put that on next week's agenda or next meeting's agenda, um, that we would uh, everyone would come come give their uh, um, update on where you're at on your technology. All right. Any other items for consideration for our next meeting? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Uh, this is Moises Lopez again. So uh, I have a question regarding and uh, maybe more for you for DOF. Um, with the May revise that came out last Friday, and there was a note in the summary report that talked about a uh, potential or a proposed 7.9% redux reduction in OPEX across all state agencies. So I'm just wondering, <clears throat> looking ahead, kind of leaning forward, if that does come through fruition, what would that, uh, how would that impact some of the things we're talking about here, specifically, um, you know, some of these uh, projects in terms of uh, capabilities to buy additional tech? I'll just speak generally to that. Um, Obviously, it, it varies department by department, but as a whole, I can you know confirm that yes, as part of the mayor vision, that was a proposed solution. Um, obviously, it's it's on the table now and will be discussed as we move into legislative budget hearings. Um, how each department will handle that is, you know, I can't speak to that. It's more going to be um, the specialists of those different departments, um, but it will be a collaborative process working with Department of Finance and and those departments on how that will be implemented. Um, whether and so I can't, you know, I can't speak specifically to each department how it will be affected, but I'm um, sure there'll be further updates in the coming months as as that decision is worked through. 
Thank you, Tess. And that, that's a really good segue into our public comment. Do we have any uh, people attending? Uh, sorry, this is Ferdinand. Sorry, I, I want to tack on to that uh, question for finance. Oh, so, Go ahead, please. Uh, will, there be, will there be a new, I mean, specific to new technology? Because I remember, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the budget letter that came out um, a few months ago specifically said no new technology implementation. So uh, in line with this question here that Moises put, to, put forward, Will there be a new budget letter um, addressing new technology? Thanks for that question. I'm happy to, to jot down that question and take it back. I, I don't have specifics on the new technology component of that budget letter, but happy to consult with my colleagues and, and follow up with you. Sorry, what was your association? Just so I can make sure I follow up with you. I'm with Caltrans, Ferdinand Milanis. Yeah, thank you. Because we, Perfect. yeah, we were in the middle of doing uh, a few different things and you know uh um the starlink was one of them that was previous but the lmr to lte were were holding back on it um so um because of that new technology uh language in the budget letter so that would be great if we can get clarification then we can either move forward or uh find a new approach so thank you much appreciated certainly thank you okay we'll move into public comment are there any um people present who wanted to make comment towards the uh, committee here? Do we have anyone online? Okay, all right, then I will um, end the public comment here. Um, at this point, um, is there any additional business or new business that anyone wants to bring in front of this committee if you're a committee member? Yeah, I'm prepared to adjourn this meeting. Do I have a... a yeah, motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion okay. to adjourn the meeting. Okay, and, and do we have a second? Okay, uh, all in favor of adjour adjourning? All right, I, I just want to thank every one of you for coming and want to remind you that, you know, it's get on the razor's edge with a quorum and I'm really happy that, that you all were able to, to, to make it today and, and don't forget budgets flipping burgers. So if you're interested in that, but thank you for attending and enjoy yourself.